1968, during a particular turbulent period of that Labour government, the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, was forced in the middle of a speech to make a comment on his own apparently fragile leadership. And he looked up to a big audience and said, You may have been wondering over the last few days what's been going on. I'll tell you what's going on. I'm going on. And at that point, there was a big applause from the audience. And Wilson had dealt with wit in a way that other leaders should take note of, uh, the question of his own future. The focus of the turbulence in terms of the leadership was Roy Jenkins. Uh, much of the media who had revered Wilson had turned on him, uh, including the owner of the Labour-supporting Mirror newspaper, though not much of the newspaper itself. This often happens in politics. Uh, Wilson was one of the few Labour leaders to get a good press, even from Conservative-supporting newspapers. But after the devaluation of the pound in 67, uh, he was turned on. And they looked elsewhere. And journalists and some newspaper owners and significantly a part of the Labour Parliamentary Party, looked to Roy Jenkins. And you could see why. Roy Jenkins, by 1968, had become Chancellor. He had already been a reforming Home Secretary, as we'll look at in a moment. And as Chancellor, after the trauma of devaluation, devaluation traumatises Prime Ministers and governments, he had stabilised things. Uh, the economy had become relatively stable. He was an orthodox chancellor. He took some tough decisions on public spending and interest rates. Um, but things were stabilised. And so he was the focus of a great deal of interest as a possible alternative prime minister. And from that moment, really, uh, for much of his political career in all kinds of different contexts, Roy Jenkins was a potential Prime Minister. He was the only figure in our series who actually got the title Prime Minister-designate much later on in his career. Um, but we'll come to that, and it wasn't very flattering. However, that term, Prime Minister, hovered around much of his career and yet he never got it. He was another Prime Minister we never had. Like some of our Prime Ministerial candidates who we never had, um, he was one who had a rich mix of cabinet experience, a massive range of interests outside politics, writing, other women, good wine, um, but he was also a reforming cabinet minister, and some to this very day regard him as one of the great post-1945 ministers. He was part of that generation. Some of our other prime ministers we never had were part of it. That generation of wartime Oxford students who uh, moved quickly into politics. Uh, he was at Oxford with Heath. Healy, huge generation of people who became subsequently political titans. Unlike, say, Heath, he uh, enjoyed himself as well at Oxford, as he was to do for the rest of his life. Indeed, his recent biographer, John Campbell, revealed that at Oxford, Roy Jenkins had something like or close to a gay affair with Tony Crossland. Uh, someone else who was to become a formidable Labour politician. Uh, but Roy Jenkins also uh, pursued women as well and uh, continued to do so even when he was married. He was a writer. Uh, there were few prime ministers we never had who wrote as voraciously as Roy Jenkins. He was, from an early age to the very end almost, a brilliant political biographer. His early biographies were of prime ministers, 
Asquith was uh, one which made a mark early on. He wrote about Lloyd George, another liberal reforming prime minister, which established Jenkins really as a Labour liberal uh, in some respects, a combination that was to become significant later on in his career. But it was as Home Secretary in that Wilson cabinet that Jenkins made his historic mark. He was a great reforming Home Secretary. And it's interesting when the history of the 60s is written, you hear a lot about the Beatles and all the kind of rock groups that were evolving in extraordinary ways in the late 1960s. But in terms of impact on people's lives, you have to look at Jenkins. He was the one who created the space for David Steele's private members uh, bill on abortion, uh, making abortion permissible and much more widely available. He uh, was the one who decriminalised homosexuality. He ended quite severe censorship in theatres. He was a reforming liberal home secretary, sometimes against the instincts of his small-c conservative prime minister, Harold Wilson. Um, but Wilson, to his credit, gave Jenkins the space to get on with it. And it took a lot of focus and it took a lot of challenging of orth orthodoxies to get this legislation on the statute book. And he did it. And after that, he faced the challenge of being Chancellor um, in the trauma of the post-devaluation era of that Labour government. And there, as I said earlier, he took a more small-c, conservative, cautious approach, but established in his relatively short time in the Treasury, a reputation for what Gordon Brown would later call prudence. And when a Labour government acquires a reputation for prudence, it tends to win elections. Against expectations, Labour lost the 1970 election. And indeed, some blamed Roy Jenkins for um, not being freer with the money. Uh, to, as chancellors often are in the build-up to that uh, a, a general election of any sort. I suspect that wasn't the reason why Labour lost, but that kind of hung around him a bit in the opposition years that followed after that 1970 defeat. After that defeat, Roy Jenkins focused on one issue. And in doing so, I think doomed his chances of ever becoming a leader, whilst reinforcing the adoration of a group of parliamentary followers. He was, at this point, deputy leader of his party. And he became the first of our prime ministers we never had to fall over Europe. It's seen often as the fate of various Tory politicians not to become leader over Europe. But this was a factor in why Roy Jenkins never got the crown. It wasn't the only one by any means, but it was a significant one. Jenkins was a passionate pro-European. And at that time, most in his party were against. The shadow cabinet were split. Uh, but the party membership was largely against. And Harold Wilson, like Jeremy Corbyn in the modern era, had to duck and weave to keep his party together. And Wilson took the decision to vote against Britain's membership of the then common market in the House of Commons. The key vote was in the autumn of 1971. Now, Wilson's own views were opaque, rather like Theresa May's as she navigates Brexit. I suspect that privately Wilson worked on the assumption that one way or another Britain was going to sign up to the common market. But he had to keep his party together. And at that point, he took the decision that to vote against was the most appropriate course available to him. Roy Jenkins could not stomach such a three-line whip and defied it. He voted in favour of Britain staying in, uh, or going in then, 
the common market, as it was then called. And a group of devoted followers, also passionate pro-Europeans, did the same. And Roy Hattersley, who was a devoted Jenkinsite, uh, wrote later that, in retrospect, it was on the evening of that vote that the formal schism of the Labour Party that was to come began to take shape. But for Jenkins, it doomed him, really. Uh, he then became an opponent of the leadership on the key issue of that era, as it is of our modern era, Europe. He remained passionately in favour and made clear when Harold Wilson, in order to keep his party together, like David Cameron, offered a referendum on Britain's membership that he would campaign passionately in Britain staying in. Jenkins, like some of his followers, was around this time becoming deeply disillusioned with the Labour Party. Another reason why Jenkins never became leader of the Labour Party and Prime Minister in that context was the Labour Party was moving to the left. Jenkins was a social democrat, as I mentioned earlier, of a sort of liberal hue, um, and the Labour Party was moving much more to the politics of Tony Benn. Um, Tony Benn, who came to torment Roy Jenkins later on. And so, in a way, whatever Jenkins had done over Europe, he would probably have never been elected by the Labour Party as it was moving as Prime Minister. There was another reason, it's an interesting one, it's been put forward by the former Labour MP Giles Radici in a book, which is that Labour's Social Democrats could never get their act together. Whenever it appeared that there was a potential vacancy in the leadership or a cause which might generate a challenge to Harold Wilson, who hung around for many years after 1968, the Social Democrats could never coalesce around one figure. Dennis Healy wanted the leadership. Tony Crossland wanted the leadership and was deeply offended when some Labour MPs backed Roy Jenkins in 1976, when there was a contest, rather than him. And so, at any point, the three of them could not say, right, we're going to back Roy Jenkins, or we're going to back Tony Crossland, or we're going to back Dennis Healy. And that fear of one of the others winning meant none of them, at any point, challenged Harold Wilson. For all the speculation around Wilson, from 1968 onwards, he served for another eight years, until 1976. And so that too was a factor. Another was this. Roy Jenkins was absolutely convinced that Labour would lose the election in February 1974, at which point he had kind of plans to fight the battles in opposition. But instead of losing, Harold Wilson won, also against his own expectations. He only just won, he had a few more seats than Ted Heath, became Prime Minister. And Jenkins, to his bewilderment, really, and not his excitement, uh, found himself in a Labour cabinet again. He was made Home Secretary. But this period was darker than that glittering, reforming Home Secretary era of the uh, mid-1960s. And Jenkins didn't like it very much. He had to deal with the IRA, terrorism. He didn't approve of much of what this minority Labour government was doing and leapt at the chance of heading off the, for Europe. He became president of the European Commission, which you would have thought would have satisfied him fully and to some extent did. And at that point, you would have assumed that as a prime ministerial figure, Jenkins' career was over. He was leaving domestic politics. But Jenkins' appetite for politics was undimmed by his move to Brussels, much as he enjoyed much of his time in Brussels and the good wines and the conversations and the politics, actually. Um, he always kept one eye on what was happening in the United Kingdom. 
And from his elevated position as an outsider, he delivered an historic talk, the Dimbleby Lecture uh, on the BBC, in which he floated the idea of a new political party. This is in the United Kingdom. And at first, not much happened. Oh, there's old Jenkins, you know, fantasising from his perch in Brussels about what's going to happen in British politics. He left it long ago. But slowly, the pebbles that he had thrown into a pond became a turbulent sea. And the SDP surfaced in 1981 and Jenkins became its leader. And at this point, it's hard to believe now, given what followed, there were many people who thought that the SDP would, in the words of Roy Jenkins, wake the mould of British politics forever. There, for a time, such was their novelty combined with weightiness, and it's the two that matter. Uh, they were way ahead in the opinion polls for a time. Uh, they were at one point uh, in the build-up to the 83 election on kind of 46%, 47%. They were winning by-elections or almost winning unwinnable seats. Jenkins himself fought the Warrington by-election in 1982, a safe Labour seat. He didn't win it, but he almost did. And he said on the night of the by-election, uh, I've had many victories. Tonight I've lost, but it's the biggest victory in my political career. And he was right in a way. It showed that the SDP was making waves in ways that um, were remarkable. But then something rather humiliating happened to Jenkins. And it's an interesting reflection on how fast the media moves. In the build-up to the 1983 general election, SDP figures, David Owen, who had a kind of charisma uh, and a weightiness himself, and many others, from the Liberal side, David Steele, who was very close to Roy Jenkins, worried that Jenkins wasn't right for the modern media, the campaigning techniques of the modern media. Now, in some ways, this is rather odd. Jenkins, such was his appetite for life and fascination for all kinds of things, had done more journalism than the rest of this lot put together. He had written many articles for all kinds of newspapers, as well as his books. He had appeared in all kinds of TV series. But that applied to Michael Foote as well, who was leading Labour into that election. And he too struggled with the modern media. It is amazing how fast the media and the reporting of politics changes. And of course, all of that generation would find today's media unrecognisable. And so the SDP Liberal Alliance came up with what they thought was a clever formula, but was actually clunky and exposed the fact that this project um, that appeared to be taking all in its stride was very fragile. They made David Steele leader of the election campaign and made Roy Jenkins prime minister designate. The implication being he would keep a lower profile in the campaign, but if they won, which there was no sign they were going to by this point, he would be prime minister. So once more, Jenkins was seen through the prism of a potential prime minister, though, as I mentioned earlier, a rather less flattering one. It was never to be. There is a view that Margaret Thatcher's decision to fight the Falklands War was the nail in the coffin for the SDP. And there's no doubt that played its part, but it wasn't decisive. The SDP was doomed from the beginning. When Roy Jenkins and others failed to persuade one of our other prime ministers we never had, Dennis Healy, not to defect. When they failed to persuade Roy Hattersley not to defect, and Roy Hattersley, as I mentioned earlier, adored Roy Jenkins. The SDP project was doomed. Jenkins was doomed never to be prime minister. For this reason, the anti-Tory opposition was split. 
And Labour was never going to die when Healy, Hattersley and others were continuing to fight within Labour. And so it was. Jenkins fought his only campaign as sort of leader, Prime Minister-designate, in 1983, and it was quite a troublesome campaign. At one point, David Steele had to call him up for a summit. It was called the Ettrick Bridge Summit. That's where Steele lived, uh, to say, come on, we've got to liven this campaign up. And Jenkins agreed to take a lower profile. It was humiliating for him. And he stood down after the 83 election. David Owen became the leader. And that was going to be his last chance, not, as I say, by the end, that it was much of a chance to be prime minister. But Jenkins' influence continued to be great. Uh, for one reason, and that reason is in the name of one person, Tony Blair. Blair became leader of the Labour Party in 1994, and he looked at the senior Labour figures still around. Jim Callaghan, a former Prime Minister, was still very much around, and several other figures from the Labour governments of the 60s and 70s, and he turned to one for advice. Uh, to the disappointment and sadness, I think, of Jim Callaghan and others, he turned to Roy Jenkins. And Roy Jenkins, for a time, became Blair's mental, almost. Jenkins said to him and gave him a kind of history lesson, because by then Jenkins was a great historian of the 20th century in British politics, and said, look, the reason the Conservatives have won so many times is that the progressive wing of British politics has always been split and your role is to bind it. And for some time, at least, Blair believed in that and spent as much time in the presence of the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Paddy Ashdown, as he did with much of his own front bench. And they talked a lot about the realignment of British politics. And Jenkins was the elder statesman of this project. Blair also asked Jenkins to write a proposal for electoral reform. Now, this all seems absurd now. Uh, we know what happened. The report that Jenkins composed was never put to a promised referendum. The landslide that Blair had won in 97 narrowed the scope for a referendum on electoral reform, which was loathed by much of his party. And Blair himself, I think, was never actually in favour, though he didn't say that to Roy Jenkins. But at the time, 97, 98, the Jenkins project seemed immense, of great historic significance. He toured the country, explaining his plans for electoral reform, and, given that it was Jenkins, wrote a very elegant proposal for electoral reform, uh, if you could make electoral reform interesting, he did. Uh, his prose could be leaden at times, but it sparkled, oddly, on the dry sub subject of electoral reform. And Blair agonised about what to do with this proposition and decided, in the end, to let his new friend down. He never held the referendum. So Jenkins' time didn't lead to that historic realignment, but he became a bigger player than some of those who were former prime ministers. He also showed that in your post-political career life, your post-prime minister will never had life, you can continue to contribute in different ways. He, um, when he had more time, uh, continued to have a great deal of fun. He ran Oxford, he kind of continued to play various sports and have incredible social life and enjoy good wine from fairly early in the day. I don't know how he did it. I once went to see him at 11 o'clock in his office in the House of Lords and I thought he'd offer me a cup of coffee. He offered me a huge glass of very good red wine. I assume it was the first of the day. But for someone who knocked back really good wine for much of the day and evening, he was incredibly productive. And his last two biographies were incredible for someone of his age. He was by then well into his 70s.
He did one first on Gladstone, who many thought was Jenkins' great hero, the liberal Gladstone. And then, after that, it was a mountainous book, um, he did one on Winston Churchill. And what made both books interesting, apart from the fact that he was able to produce them, um, was the fact that he put it in the context of his own experience of a politician, what it was like to speak at a dispatch box at times of intense personal political pressure, what it was like to contemplate leaving a political party, as Churchill did and Roy Jenkins did. And it gave the book an accessibility, both of them, um, that is unusual for books of such depth range and many hundreds of pages. After the Churchill one, I interviewed him and asked him which of those two prime ministers uh, he rated most of all. And to my surprise, he said Churchill. I thought he would say Gladstone. But he was almost overwhelmed by Churchill's range and zest for life in so many different spheres. And in that respect, Jenkins could have been talking about himself. Because although, unlike Churchill, he never became prime minister, he lived a life of astonishing range. He had times quite capable of being pompous and rather grand, but at other times absolutely rooted. A real curiosity about politics, about journalism. He once said to me during the New Labour era, it must be so difficult being a columnist in this period because all you've got to write about is Blair and Brown. And he was right, of course. He contrasted it with his own era in politics where you couldn't move for heavyweights from Crossland to Jenkins, to Michael Foote, to Tony Benn, to Shirley Williams, to Barbara Castle, wherever you looked on his side, and that's before even looking on the other. That very range of prime ministers we never had, heavyweights, made it more difficult for him ever to go the whole way. But of the many prime ministers we've never had, there is no doubt in very practical ways, Jenkins made history. And although in the final phase, the new Labour phase, he was not as influential as he hoped he might be, even then, some of his ideas and radicalism fed in to that very well-controlled or intensively controlled new Labour machine. He was a player from the beginning to almost the very end.